we want to thank you for being present here today on these historic grounds. I'm Rebecca Helterbrand with Clarity Child Guidance Center and the One in Five Minds campaign. People worldwide remember the Alamo as a, his, as a heroic struggle against overwhelming odds, a place where the ultimate sacrifice for freedom was made. For this reason, the Alamo remains hallowed ground and the shrine of Texas liberty. It's at this spot, this revered spot in our history that this group of people takes a stand for the kids in our community that need care. Whether you're a dedicated leader, a healthcare provider, an advocate, a mom, a dad, a sister that is taking a stand for the kids in need, we are really happy to have you here today because you are supporting thousands of kids in need. And I'm not lying when I say thousands. In fact, in Bear County alone, if you apply the one in five mind statistic that one in five children will have a mental, emotional, behavioral disorder, that means 80,000 kids in Bear County alone will need help. So now, this beautiful installation of pinwheels, there are 3,000 here today, and the pinwheel is our symbol of the hope and healing and iconic joy that comes from a well-lived childhood. So of these pinwheels, every fifth one is yellow. That is to represent the one in five kids that will have issues with mental health and need support. And that yellow pinwheel is a reminder, a constant reminder, that treatment and early identification is important for these kids in order to experience that childhood joy that is so richly deserved. But today, of those one in five children, only one in five will get help for their mental illness. What this means is there's significant barriers to the treatment, and we're starting with stigma. The fact that we don't talk about our kids' mental health is hurting children and their families, and they can't even access the resources that are available. And we all know in the system of care that we need more providers. We need better insurance coverage. We need more resources but we're having trouble getting to those core issues because we can't get past the stigma. Now, without care and treatment, these one in five kids suffer a variety of societal ills. This isn't something you would want for your child, let alone your own community. But these children, they will drop out of high school. They will become addicted to drugs and alcohol because they're self-medicating their pain. They have a higher likelihood of being incarcerated they have a higher likelihood of becoming homeless. And worst of all, suicide is the third leading cause of death in our young people, and we need to do more for our kids. That's why One in Five Minds was created, so that we could start the conversation, so we could end the stigma. We have to stop this cycle of silence, and it starts here today with you. So I'd like to introduce Clarity Child Guidance Center's President and CEO, Fred Hines, to tell you more. Thank you, Rebecca, and we're glad to see you all here today. We appreciate you being here. We had ordered just a slightly cooler day, but you know, not everything always works the way you planned it. Clarity believes in hope, and hope starts with unity and support, and that's what we've got here today. One in Five Minds, Texas' first children's mental health advocacy campaign was designed for just that purpose. And we're here today to provide that unity and support and to open up the conversation about mental health. We gather here to say it's okay to talk about it with our family, with our friends, our neighbors, coworkers, and teachers. Recent research has shown that 80% of parents did not know of any resource for a child in need of mental health treatment. Texas, unfortunately, ranks number 50 in mental health workforce availability, with only one provider for 1,757 individuals, about a fifth of what we really need and what the leading states in the United States have. So we have more families needing service but have difficulty finding access to care. Standing with us today 
are a number of community partners and agencies who have also worked tirelessly to treat and advocate for our children suffering from mental illness. Uh, as I look over here, we lost Barbara Gentry. There she is. Barbara Gentry's here uh, representing United Way of, of Bear County, of San Antonio, and they have, have undertaken a great project this summer of expanding programs, looking at new services, and mental health was one of the ones, and Barbara just happened to chair that committee, and thank you, Barbara. From the National Alliance for Mental Illness, right there next to her is Lisa Jensen. Lisa, thank you. Uh, from the Nix Specialty Healthcare Center, I think we have Michelle Shipman. There you are. You're, she's hiding over there. And Patty Murillo. Thank you, thank you. Uh, from the Children's Bereavement Center, I think I saw Marion Sokol come in. Marion, thank you. From Voices for Children, Kathy Fletcher. From the Center for Healthcare Services, Leanne Lindsay. Did I see Elizabeth Lutz come in? Okay, so that's the Health Collaborative, thank you. And from the Bear County Mental Health Department, Gilbert Gonzalez, and Gilbert brought his staff along with him. So you can see, for the county, we've got three people. So just one more example of all the shortages, right? So, but they do a great job, and we appreciate it. So we're grateful for all of their support. And uh, to highlight some of the needs that we just talked a little bit about, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Steve Pliska, Chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. And he comes out of the background of being a specialist in children's mental health. So, Steve. For physicians, when families call and their child is in need, we want most to respond. But the sad fact is that particularly when families are in crisis, you know, we just don't have the resources to do it. Uh, today, we have about the same number of psychiatric beds for children in San Antonio that we had 40 years ago, despite the enormous growth in the population of the city. Many times when families call, they hear that all the beds are full, they're told to go to an emergency room. I know of cases where kids have had to sit and wait sometimes two, three days in the emergency room before help became available. And then sometimes when they come out of the hospital, there are not the critical follow-up follow services that are need, needed. So we really can do a lot more. Uh, we need to attract more providers into the profession. Uh, we need to find the sources of funding so that people that are uninsured or underinsured can also access those services. And the benefit of doing so will be lower crime rates, lower rates of substance abuse, and better uh, rates of productivity for our, our future citizens. So I, I applaud Clarity and all of uh, people who come here today to support this cause. Thank you. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, the youngest appeals court justice in the state of Texas, an advocate for children's mental health, uh, a friend, colleague, and uh, she just happens to be from the fourth court of appeals, and it's Justice Luz Elaine Chapa. Please. I'm a multitasker, but I'm not that talented. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Fred, for that lovely introduction, and thank you to Clarity Child Guidance Center for the invitation today to be here. It is truly an honor. In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. A dear friend of mine posted that quote from George Orwell on Facebook along with the link to my commentary that was published this past Monday in the San Antonio Express News. She prefaced the quote with, love you, amiga. Now, I'm not sure whether I'm more moved by Orwell's quote or my friend's own words, love you, amiga. Both have profound significance in my world. To me, the universal deceit is the stigma associated with mental illness that consumes our society. The stigma undoubtedly has taken on a life of its own. 
For years, it has penetrated our minds, our hearts, and our souls. Excuse me. And it exists in every facet of our lives, whether at work, home, doctor's offices, schools, grocery stores, you name it, it's there. The stigma is stronger than any force and it's one that we, we must reckon with. We can't see its darkness or touch its thorns. We can't smell its foul odor or taste its bitterness. But we can definitely feel the destruction it causes in the lives of the mentally ill and of the loved ones who care for them. My friend thinks that telling the truth and sharing my family's story is a revolutionary act. And how fitting, especially in light of where we are today on the battlegrounds of the Alamo. I can't lie about being humbled yet flattered by the latter part of the quote, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. But folks, I'm not, revo I'm not the revolutionary type, nor am I the revolutionary one. My brother is. He's revolutionary to me because he gave me permission to use his voice and my mother gave us the blessing as a family to come forward and share our family story. It takes, it does take a type, revolu excuse me, it does take a revolutionary type mindset to achieve radical change. And there is no doubt in my mind that the more people who come forward to tell the truth and share personal stories, the likelihood of acceptance dramatically increases. The more we share, the more we learn. And when we do, we break down stigma. You see, my 32-year-old handsome and courageous brother, Michael, he has schizophrenia. He was officially diagnosed with this mental illness in his late teens, early 20s. He started to self-medicate in his early teens. But as soon as my mother began to notice his demeanor change, she took him to countless number of doctors. They all told her the same team, the same thing. Michael, he's a typical young boy growing up on the border who partakes in an occasional, um, occasionally he drinks alcohol and smokes marijuana. It's no big deal, all is fine. Yes, his behavior is bad and not acceptable, but it's attributable to re rebellion and testing boundaries and nothing else. Oh, but how they were wrong. And to this day, I carry an insurmount insurmountable amount of guilt because I never asked why. I never asked Michael why he was using marijuana and alcohol. All I did was get mad at him and act like an uncompassionate big sister. Imagine if I had asked why. He might have told me that he was self-medicating to silence the voices in his head that were tormenting him. He would have been benefited from an early diagnosis and early treatment. Imagine how different his world would be today. He perhaps would not be living with my mother. Perhaps he would have been able to complete his college education rather than only 60 hours. Perhaps he would have a job, a family. Perhaps it wouldn't take my mother going through six dentist offices until finally finding one that would accept him as a patient. Even though he has been insured his entire life. I am not aware of any program that benefits someone like Michael. Right now, I am consumed with feelings of frustration and despair. <clears throat> Yet my mother, Michael's number one advocate, remains hopeful. Me, not so much. I don't know what the future holds for Michael, but I will say this. I am not giving up. I am not throwing in the towel, and I am going to continuously share my family's story. And I'm going to do so so that the light of hope doesn't burn out for others for the young children who so desperately need the early diagnosis and the early treatment. I often think of the pinwheel which Clarity has chosen to represent hope for the young ch children who are battling mental illness or showing early symptoms. Indeed, the pinwheel is a happy symbol. But folks, think about how the pinwheel operates. If we don't continuously blow, blow on it, if it is not installed in a windy spot, it stops to work. We must continue to come forward and share our personal stories so that the pinwheel continues to operate so that these children can truly feel that sense of hope that they so desperately want. 
But more importantly, if we don't come forward and we continue to live in the shadows, our community leaders like Judge Wolf will never fully appreciate the dire need of funding, of resources, of treating facilities, of programs who would benefit someone like Michael and all these children who do need the help. So I ask you, it's time, share your story, ask for help, leave those feelings of shame and embarrassment behind because let me be perfectly clear and please allow these words to sink in. There is no shame in mental illness, none whatsoever. It's not taboo, it's health related just like cancer, diabetes, or emphysema. Michael didn't choose his illness, it chose him, and he deserves to be loved, embraced, and accepted. Just as like everyone else who is battling a mental illness. So let's start treating mental illness just like any other condition or ailment. The more we talk about it, the more people become comfortable and begin to accept those who through no fault of their own have a mental illness. Last February was the first time I spoke publicly about Michael, and this week was the first time our family story was shared in print. I'll be honest, you can tell I'm emotional. It's been an emotional week. But I'm emotional because there has been an outpour of love and support. People who I had never imagined would come forward did. Many said their family is dealing with the same issues. Many said our family has given theirs courage to seek help. A countless number of thank yous has flooded my phone, email, and Facebook account. But I am the one who is thankful. I am still overcome by the sense of relief accompanied with sharing my family story. Because in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Thank you. Now it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our next speaker, a great man and a great friend, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf. Judge Wolf has helped transform the role of county government since taking office in 2001. One of the first major issues he would tackle was an overcrowded jail that was draining Bear County's general fund. This led Judge Wolf and Commissioner's Court to create the Mental Health Court which, which helps get nonviolent offenders with a mental health diagnosis out of jail and into treatment. More recently, he approved the creation of the county's first mental health department under the office of the county manager. This department is tasked with serving as commissioner's court's advocate and its expert on mental health issues, as well as leading the planning and coordination among the community's behavioral health stakeholders all in an effort to make Bear County a national model of a mentally healthy community. Please help me welcome Judge Wolf. Well, thank you, Judge Chapa, and thanks for your courageousness in working with your family and your brother. The sad part of society is we make it worse for people like Michael. They stumble along and they get on the wrong side of the law. They get thrown in jail. Their condition worse. And it's a spiraling downward effort. Some 14 years that I've been there now, we've tried to change that cycle by doing more in treatment and less incarceration. As Judge Chapa said, we started the first uh, mental health court uh, we now have Gilbert Gonzalez working full time. We're on central magistration trying to divert uh, people that have mental illness to, to help them. We've had an early invention program uh, where a policeman can decide to take someone to one of our treatment facilities rather than to the jail. And so a lot of effort has been made. But the real problem, I think, is what Clarity is trying to um, trying to address, and that's the early intervention. A lot of people come from good, solid families where love is there, and they have an issue. They may have an Ill, a mental issue that society didn't throw on them, but they were born with, whether it's genetic or whatever it is. And those that 
have a chance to make it because they got the love and concern of their family and, uh, and, and willing to reach out and, and, and someone like a sister, like Judge Chapa, that's uh, crying her heart out and doing everything that she can do to help her brother. And with love like that and with help, uh, he's gonna be okay. Where the real tragedy is though, is in the families where there's a mental health issue combined with a drug or an alcohol issue, and they find themselves with their children at home under a traumatic situation under which they could be scarred for life mentally. They may be fine physically, but they're scarred mentally. We run a factory. We run a factory called CPS, Child Protective Services. And that factory gr grinds through a lot of families, extracts them away from the family in many instances, I believe over a thousand in the last year, throws them into a system of families that take turns of keeping them for a while where six different families may manage uh, the child and the child comes out of that scarred. In some good cases, we may find a, uh, a uh, family that will adopt, but where we're failing is on the front end and we're gonna change that. We've got a new district attorney in town that I'm very proud of. And we've sat down with Judge Sakai, and we've come up with two or three different plans, and we're implementing some of those ourselves at the county commissioner's level. We spent over 2.8 million, I believe it is, with Child Protective Services, and we're extracting now people out of that that says you're gonna spend time with families. We've got 10 of them that are gonna focus just on the family and trying to hold them together and treat the mental or the drug problem of the family and try to help that kid from being scarred and extracted away. When you extract a kid away from a family, you damage him and they never get over it. I have an adopted daughter and it took to when she became an adult before she finally found her mother. She never forgot her mother. And it's a real difficult, difficult situation. So what we're trying to do on the early end and Judge Sakai is leading the effort, the district attorney is leading the effort to try to hold families together to make them well, to make the place a good place where a child can grow up. We put additional money into the effort. My wife is raising money now for early intervention cases of where a child is from birth to three years old, which is where you can really catch them. So that whole change that we're making separate and apart from what we're doing in the criminal justice system to try to help people, I believe is gonna make a difference. Uh, we are committed to it we, through the Center for Healthcare Services that we fund, through our huge hospital district, Bear County Hospital District, that treat a lot of mental cases. We're doing our best with the cooperation of the sheriff, the district attorney, the judges to keep people out of jail and treat them and to intervene early in families and try to stabilize them. So we do have a lot of problems, but I think we're on the right road to uh, curing a lot of them. I think we all understand the devastating effects of mental illness. I doubt that there's a family anywhere here today or anywhere in the United States that doesn't have some relative that struggled with it. And, uh, but we're there to help them. But in many cases, there's nobody there to help that kid unless we help stabilize the family. So we're gonna work to play, play a better role with clarity in the early intervention pieces and to have people actually at the courthouse when these kids come through the children's court uh, to try to be there to help them early on and try to hold the family together and hold the family unit together. So, Fred, I want to thank uh, what Clarity's doing in the community and the tremendous effort and the work of Dr. Plisky uh, out at uh, UTA. And you're, he's correct, we're way behind on the number of psychiatrists that we need in our community. We don't have enough of them. And hopefully the education system will address, will address that issue. But we're gonna work with you through Aurora on our staff and then with uh, Gilbert Gonzalez. And, and we wanna be a full partner with you and we wanna get there earlier than what we've been getting there. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Wall. We wanna thank all of our speakers, our dignitaries, and those of you that came out today to weather this humid day on these historic grounds at a historic moment in the One in Five Minds campaign.
Now here's what you can do from this point forward. Now you know. It's not enough to walk away from this moment and take that pinwheel and think about what Joy experienced in hearing the story of Justice Chapa and how we all need a sister like her in our lives. You have to do something. So here's what you can do. You can stop by that booth right there. You can sign up um, to be an advocate for One in Five Minds. You can use your mobile device and download smart graphics to Facebook and Twitter and share them with others and start the conversation. You can also help us with this amazing pinwheel display. Here's the deal, these pinwheels are meant to be shared. So we're gonna challenge each of you to take two, three, five, ten 10 today, because our goal is to spread the message that these one in five kids matter. And we're gonna do that through the pinwheel. And you will end up being the wind that creates that pinwheel to spin. So thank you all for being here today and get those pinwheels started. Thank you.